You know what you call the only Type 9C German U-boat left in existence? America's. Today we're talking about the time that America stole an entire German submarine and then stuck it in the middle of Chicago. I mean, when America strategically transferred a piece of equipment to an alternate location. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Warwood Tools, a family-owned business that for over 160 years has been making sledgehammers and axes right out of West Virginia using American 1060 high carbon steel. And to this day, they still make all their tools using World War II era drop hammer forging. So if you want some tools that are going to outlast you, I would recommend Warwood Tools and I'll have them linked in the description down below. Moving on. Okay, important context in case you don't know. During World War II, American supply lines to the European theater were absolutely devastated by German U-boats, aka submarines. These German U-boats are credited with sinking over 2,700 American ships, totaling in over 14 million tons of American ships and supplies that were put at the bottom of the ocean. Because of this, America would form what is known as hunter-killer groups, task forces of American ships who were sent out and their entire job was to hunt and destroy these enemy submarines. Because that's just how America gets down. We don't believe in self-defense. We believe in self-offense. It's way more efficient. And that's pretty much all the context you need. So April 4th, 1944, a hunter-killer group known as Task Force 22.3 would set out, engage, and destroy the German U-boat 515. Absolutely everything went according to plan. Nothing was out of the ordinary. They hit it with depth charges, critically wounding the submarine, forcing it to surface one last time to allow the crew to escape before the submarine would sink below the ocean waves forever. But it was on this particular day that the American commander, Daniel Gallery, would take unique notice of the fact that the German submarines always surfaced to allow their crew to escape. And he decided that he was going to do something unprecedented, something that no American sailor had done since 1815. He was going to send out a boarding party and steal that enemy submarine. He immediately puts a plan into action, assembling two separate boarding parties, each to be comprised of one officer and eight enlisted men. And these eight enlisted men are going to be the top eight guys that you would absolutely want on hand to be able to address any problem that could arise with keeping this submarine from sinking to the ocean floor. People like the electrician, the machinist, the boat swain's mate, the torpedo technician. Oh, and the photographer. Yeah, one of the eight people going on the extremely dangerous and important mission is going to be a photographer because, you know picks or it didn't happen, right? America's about to do some gangster shit. You best believe we're going to designate somebody to stand in the corner with the camera and yell world star while we do it. June 1st, 1944, Task Force 22.3 receives intel that there's an enemy submarine operating off the coast of Africa. That submarine would turn out to be U-Boat 505, and they would head to it immediately. And this poor U-Boat has absolutely no idea what's coming for it, because at this point in time, this task force is comprised of the flagship and escort carrier, the USS Guadalcanal, as well as five destroyer escorts, the USS Pope, the Pillsbury, the Jinx, the Chatelaine, and the Flaherty. And if you don't know what a destroyer escort is, at this point in time, it is a ship that has one job and one job only, and that is to fuck up enemy submarines. Okay, this hunter-killer group is rolling up on this U-boat like Debo on a beach cruiser. Somebody's about to have a bad day, and it's probably not going to be them. Oh, shit. June 4th, 1944, after three days of chasing down this U-boat, they would finally catch up to it, and the USS Guadalcanal would immediately scramble two Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters as the rest of the destroyer escorts made their way towards the submarine. U-boat 505 was already submerged and underwater, but the Grumman F-4F Wildcat pilots are able to see the long, dark shadow of the submarine underneath the water because it's broad daylight. And once they confirm that it is, in fact, an enemy submarine, the destroyer escorts begin loading their hedgehogs to fire upon it. If you don't know what a hedgehog is, it is the most feared anti submarine weapon in all of World War II. It is like a fully automatic mortar capable of firing over a wide area. Once these mortars hit the water, they can plunge into the depths of the ocean at 33 feet per second. And as soon as they make impact with anything, they will explode and destroy it. The hedgehogs would detonate early, not scoring a direct hit, but still rocking and damaging the submarine, jamming its propeller and putting out its lights. Quickly realizing they hadn't done enough damage, the destroyer escorts above would begin launching depth charges. The depth charges would rupture the hull of U-Boat 505 and the entire submarine would be forced to surface one last time as the hatch would open and all the German sailors would begin flooding out onto its deck and into life rafts. At this point, the American boarding party grabbed their Tommy guns, hopped in their whaling boat, and made their way over to the submarine. They received no resistance from the Germans as they made their way down the hatch into the sub and began working on it to try to save it. Okay, time out. I need to make sure that you fully grasp how ridiculous what these nine Americans are about to do actually is. Okay, you have a German U-boat that is so critically damaged that the 50 men 
that have been living on this U-boat, that have been trained on this U-boat. This U-boat has controls in their language and in their units of measurement. And they have decided cumulatively that, hey, this thing is so damaged that we need to run for our lives. And then while they were evacuating, they would also play scuttling charges, which are large explosive devices that detonate, ensuring that the ship sinks so that America can't retrieve it. So not only is the situation so bad that 50 of them can't fix it, but they made the situation worse on their way out. And you now have nine Americans, one of which is a fucking camera guy, going in there to do what they couldn't pull off. This mission is seemingly impossible and borderline insane, but they do it anyways because... America. So they get inside the sub and begin going to work immediately. The torpedo technicians and ordnance officers begin defusing scuttling charges as the electricians go to work at trying to get the bilge pumps back up and running to pump water out of the submarine. And the damage control men and the machinists begin working on plugging holes and getting the motor back up and running. And while all of this is going on, the officer in charge of the American boarding party, Lieutenant Albert David, notices that the submarine is sinking so fast that there is now water pouring into the open hatch on top. And it is at this moment that he has to make a split decision. He either has to get his men out and save their lives or he has to shut the hatch and give them more time to work but if they can't pull it off they are all going to die in that submarine and without thinking twice he closes the hatch a few minutes later the second boarding party would board u-boat 505 and they would attempt to open the hatch to get inside the submarine and help but the sinking submarine had created such a powerful vacuum that it was impossible so they did the next best thing they got a tow line tied the u-boat 505 to the uss guadalcanal as the uss guadalcanal began towing the now sinking U-boat. Feeling that they were now moving, the Americans on the inside had an ingenious idea. You see, the U-boat didn't have enough power for anything but lights. They were running entirely on batteries. The reason they didn't have power is because the propeller was jammed, and the propeller was jammed because they couldn't get the motor going again. So, what they did was they disconnected the drive shaft between the motor and the propeller, allowing the propeller to free spin in the current of the USS Guadalcanal as it's being towed. This would turn the alternator, generating power, and giving the U-boat enough power to activate its bilge pumps and begin pumping water out of it. I cannot stress to you enough how fucking genius this was to do. This saved all of their lives for sure, and to be able to have the knowledge and wisdom to come up with a solution like that while you're actively fucking dying in a tin can under the ocean is incredible. So things are already looking up, but at a minimum, they have to get that hatch back open so that the first boarding crew can escape if they absolutely need to. So the second boarding crew with their Tommy guns proceeds to pluck one of the Germans out of their life raft and force him, I mean, persuade him to activate the pressure valve, which is gonna equalize the pressure inside and outside the sub, allowing them to open the hatch door. That happens and the second boarding crew gets inside and also gets to work. And all this is going on and there's 50 Germans sitting out there in life rafts like, fuck. Like, what do you do in that situation? You have just been outclassed on every conceivable level. Like, you were in combat, they damaged your ship to the point that you couldn't fix it, so then you tried to rage quit and blow up your own ship, and then they're like, no, no, I've changed my mind. And then they went in there and made it so you couldn't even sink your own ship. At this point, the rest of the task force goes around plucking all the Germans out of their life rafts because they are now prisoners of war, as Commander Gallery comes to the conclusion, fuck it, we're just gonna have to tow the sinking submarine while it's actively sinking all the way to the nearest American port, and we're just gonna have to have sailors in there working 24 seven around the clock to try to keep it above the waterline. Not a terrible plan, but the only problem is they're like 150 miles off the coast of Africa and the nearest American port is 2,500 miles away. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's in fucking Bermuda, you know, where the whole triangle thing is. I mean, the disrespect with this is absolutely palpable. Could you imagine being one of these Germans sitting there like, not only are you not allowed to sink your own ship, you're not even allowed to rage quit. The Americans come in, steal your shit, and now they're going to joyride it through the Bermuda Triangle and not even lose it just to flex on you like that? It's ridiculous. So they get everything buttoned up and they get underway, headed out to Bermuda. At which point, a couple days later, the commander of the German submarine wakes up in the infirmary on the USS Guadalcanal. Apparently, he had been hit in the head and lost consciousness for a number of days. At which point, Commander Gallery comes down to have a conversation with him, and he's like, hey, here's the deal. We stole your sub. We're towing it to the Bermuda Triangle for a joyride. It's gonna be great. The German commander absolutely refuses to believe him. He's like, that's not possible. I had 50 dudes. They weren't able to save that sub. We scuttled it on the way out for insurance. There's no way that you managed to keep that sub from sinking. At which point, Commander Gallery is like, oh, well, uh, 
Here's all the shit from your office that's distinctly not waterlogged. Um, also, if you look out the window, we're towing your submarine behind us right now. At which point the German officer completely loses his shit. He starts crying. He's completely inconsolable. He's like, when my chain of command finds out that this happened, they're going to torture me and then they're going to kill me. Or the other way around. I don't know. This is absolutely terrible. But Commander Gallery, being the cool guy that he is, he's like, hey, buddy, pal, friend, you're going to sit in a nice POW camp for the duration of the war. We're going to win, and by the time you get to go back home, you're not going to have a chain of command, and all of your leadership infrastructure is going to be completely dismantled. I wouldn't worry about it. Didn't really make him feel better, but I thought it was funny. Now, so they're still making their way towards that big triangle thing, but pulling this submarine and keeping it from taking on water is a constant struggle, and it's starting to look like they're not going to be able to keep enough water out of this submarine long enough to get it all the way to Bermuda. So, they start interviewing Germans, trying to find one with technical knowledge that would be willing to help them keep it afloat. And that is when they they come across a young German sailor by the name of Felix Ewald, and he would inform them that not only is he not German, he's definitely not a Nazi, and he's certainly not a fan. He was conscripted when the Nazis invaded Poland, and he was basically being forced to be there, and that if America wanted help, he was happy to do so. So he would immediately go to work helping the Americans keep the submarine afloat the entire time as they traveled back to Bermuda. As the remaining German POWs began asking questions, what happened to Felix? What happened to Ewald? Where is Ewald? And they began looking for him every chance they got, searching everywhere they could find him. The Americans had told him that they killed him, but they didn't believe it because they knew he was Polish too. So they just kept looking and looking, scanning everywhere. And this would be the inspiration for the childhood book, Where's Waldo? I'm just kidding. I made that part up. Anyways, with the help of Felix, they managed to tow this submarine all the way to Bermuda. They get it fixed up. It's definitely not going to sink, at which point they get to go in and really start looking at what intel they had managed to gather. And holy shit, there is an up-to-date active Enigma cipher machine on board. This is what the Germans were using to send all their secret military communications, and it could prove absolutely invaluable. They also had a bunch of up-to-date ciphers and a bunch of other documents that were deemed so important that they were printed on water-soluble paper so that if the boat did sink and these documents got wet, they would completely disintegrate and be unrecoverable. It is at this point that the American leadership decides the Germans have to think that this boat went down and everyone died. We cannot let them know that we have this information because now we're going to be able to decode all of their secret transmissions and we don't want them to change the code. So they take U-Boat 505, they actually paint it to look like an American submarine and then start referring to it as the USS Nemo, which if you don't know is Latin for no one. They then take all the German POWs from U-Boat 505 505, send them to Louisiana, where they are going to be completely segregated from all the other POWs, so nobody knows who they are or where they came from. All the American sailors are then ordered to turn over all of the souvenirs that they gathered out of U-Boat 505 and to shut the fuck up about it, and as far as anyone on the planet needs to be concerned, this U-Boat is at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, 150 miles off the coast of Africa. Nobody can know that we have this. Buh! If those Germans weren't allowed to write home through the Red Cross, that's technically a Geneva Convention violation. Buh! First of all, when you're on the winning side, those aren't actually rules, they're more like suggestions. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. Secondly, let's just be honest here. If you were a POW in World War II and the worst thing that happened to you is you weren't allowed to write home while you were being well-fed and treated with dignity, you came out on top. All right, so somehow the United States manages to keep this thing a complete secret until May 7th, 1945, when Germany issues their unconditional surrender. And it is at this point that the smack talking can now commence because now we are going to take this submarine, you know, the only remaining Type 9C German sub left on the planet, even though they manufactured hundreds, we sunk all of them, except for this one. Now we're going to drive that bitch to Philadelphia and use it to raise funds and anybody that buys a bunch of war bonds can get a guided tour of this German sub because a lot of people quit buying war bonds after Germany surrendered because they thought the war was coming to an end and we were still fighting the war in the Pacific against the Japanese so this was like a huge fundraising opportunity and that's exactly what they did. They sold a ton of war bonds as soon as that started slowing down hey we'll tow it to another major US city they towed it up to New York then New York bought a bunch of war bonds and then World War II would finally come to an end when Japan issued their unconditional surrender and now we've got this German submarine and we don't know what to do with it. So the US government does what the US government do and they're like, hear me out, what if we shot nuclear bombs at it for science? At which point, Commander Gallery, who's now an admiral, chimes in and is like, no, I stole that thing fair and square, we're keeping it. So he ends up orchestrating a deal with the city of Chicago where the U.S. government will donate the submarine to the city of Chicago as long as the city pays to have it shipped 
all the way there. And that's exactly what happens. They took a Type 9C German submarine, the whole thing, in one piece and put it in Chicago. You know, like the major city that's the most inland of any other city in America. It's literally fucking two Germanys into America. Yes, that is to scale. An incredible logistical feat is the icing on the cake for one of the most amazing and utterly disrespectful stories to ever come out of World War II. And I'm happy to say that if you would ever like to go see U-Boat 505, you still can because it is still in Chicago today at the Museum of Science and Industry where it currently sits as a proud member of the second largest Navy on the planet. Planet, America's fleet of museum ships. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. On June 19th, the U-505 was towed into Bermuda. And there remains, as a prize of war, one less wolf to hunt with the pack.